Trey, one of the signs of a mature industry is that in order to compete with new technology, new suppliers in the marketplace, the dominant industry adopts new technologies to lower its cost, increase its productivity. What have we seen in terms of some of the new technologies that the oil and gas industry in the, U in the U.S. Has, uh, has adopted? Sure. So um, there's obviously with the hot topic that er is on everybody's mind right now, which is AI. And um, what we're seeing is that um, the oil and gas industry, uh, especially on the front end of deciding where they're going to drill oil, um, they're, they're able to isolate not only exactly where they need to be drilling, but also with those long, large language models, um, what the what the smaller wells that are coming in afterwards should look like to m most optimize their drilling to drain that field as field as best as possible. So, um, and again, that means you're drilling fewer wells over time because you're optimizing it to to get the most with the least amount of um, um, wells drilled, and that leads to fewer people. Sure, because uh, I'm not sure uh, how much our viewers are familiar with how. Uh, oil gets drilled, but the first thing you do is is geoscientists uh, do surveys to map the you know where the like the reservoir is, how much oil is down there, and then based on that they make decisions about where to drill. And it's very data intense uh, now. And extremely so, yeah. So if you've got if you've got AI to help you sort through that data and be more accurate, uh, then you need fewer geoscientists. To do the work because the AI is doing the work. That's only so. It's not just the the folks on the drilling rig, but there's a lot of white collar work uh, behind the scenes, engineers and geoscientists and so on, that now are going to feel the pinch because of the rise of AI. It, yeah, that's definitely the case, and uh, and you could see it flow all the way down to the administrative structure with um, just handling the whole process of of, of billing and receivables. Um, it, it will definitely change the flow of, of, of work. Yeah, a little anecdote here. Uh, I was I wrote a book on the Alberta oil sands uh, that was published in 2019. And in 2018, I, I interviewed uh, a the IT director for what was then a big oil company in Alberta since been been merged with another one. But he said at that time, he said, AI is going to have the same effect on the administrative side of the oil companies that Excel had back in the 1990s. I mean, it's just going to re increase productivity. And he said, we're going, to lose, we're going to lose workers in areas that you wouldn't think of, like filing, because you don't have to file anymore. The, the AI will do it digitally. We'll, we won't have to have big law, uh, you know, legal teams because the paralegals and the associates will be replaced by AI uh, drafting briefs based on digital li uh, law libraries. All of those things, there's a whole infrastructure behind the scenes in an oil company that is going to be shrunk because of the introduction and adoption of AI. And, and, and definitely what you've seen in other industries is the oil and gas industry is uh, very quick to embrace new technologies. So they'll get it um, working faster than other industries will because they're so much more incentivized to do so, to, to lower their costs. It's very interesting to me, uh, the, my, my email inbox over a period of time, you know, years, is a good indicator of the trends in, in this field. And the reason I say that is because, you know, seven, eight years ago, I didn't see much in the way of announcements of new technologies. And then it started to build. And all of a sudden, you know, there were uh, all sorts of uh, innovations and stories about how the U.S. Uh, shale oil patch was innovating to increase productivity, lower its employment re requirements, and conferences were being held. I mean, those are all signs that an industry is hopping on the technology bandwagon and embracing it. And uh, would you agree that we're, we're, uh, there's still lots of runway here for the industry to reduce its uh, headcount with technology? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it, it's definitely the case where uh, they're continuing to figure out ways to um, improve the production profile of a well. And as they do that, um, 
um, I, I don't think they've gotten to the optimizing. You know, we're talking like, oh, if you uh, improve by 1%, it's a huge dollar increase of, I'm saying 1% more production out of the well as a percentage of what you think you could get. Um, it, it, it changes the numbers dramatically. So to the extent that they can um, extract more from the well that they have already have in their inventory, yeah, I think it's going to definitely um, see more innovation, which continues to um, uh, reduce the need for headcount. And one of the thing, uh, characteristics of the U.S. industry is that it has a lot of the innovation in, uh, in uh, shale technology, in uh, tight oil uh, technology. So the, uh, the shale industry is highly innovative now, and it's always coming up with, with new, either new technologies or the next iteration of an existing technology that makes it better and better and, and, needs, and needs fewer people. And so this cycle of innovation, it, it got launched years ago, and it doesn't, you know, I don't see any end to it in sight, which only argues for more technology, fewer workers. Yeah, you mentioned many years ago. Um, so like the shale revolution, so to speak, in the United States really started, you know, um, as far as adopting it around 2006. And as as they adopted it and found out that, uh, oh, in the first place, they went from um, your percentage of wells that um, were successful wells, it all of a sudden just jumped exponentially as far as... Um, uh, it, it, it used to be more of a, a crapshoot in the oil and gas industry when you drilled a well, whether it was going to be a producer or a dry hole. And the shale revolution really changed that. And so what I was going to get to was that back in whenever they realized that, you started to see them add people. We were well under a million people in oil and gas employment back in 2004 to 2006 time frame and then just started creeping up as as they were trying to figure out and develop this all these new technologies well now you're on the other side of that curve where while you're developing the technologies you're not trying them out and testing them in, in, in wells as much you're 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 going out and applying that technology more now so now we're stepping down the ladder as far as the need for people and um we're about to be at a point where we're going to need fewer people than we did back in 2004. There's an angle to this that we don't talk about very much, but I'm seeing it behind the scenes a lot. And that is the demand for investors demand for return on capital because early in the industry, and when we're not talking there for a long time, wall street basically uh, floated the shale industry. It wasn't profitable. And then it finally innovated enough, innovated enough that it was. And then Wall Street said, aha, now it's time we want a return on our capital. And so they squeeze the producers and that, and that pressure at that level then translates into the need to increase productivity down in the field so that there's more money, more, you know, to uh, return to the investors. Would you agree or, yeah. or disagree? I would totally agree with that. And I would make this simple observation. Investors in, in, in the capital markets, they look at industries and they invest based on how much they think it's going to grow. And it is growth that they're for the whole entire industry that they're looking at that drives how they value the companies themselves. So what you're seeing in AI right now is they're seeing tremendous growth. And that's why there's tremendous valuations of these companies. On the other side, they're looking at oil and gas and they're saying, it's a mature industry. We don't see that growth anymore. So we're not going to buy it for growth. We're buying it for a return on our investment from the actual um, cash flow stream. So it's like a different perspective that they're now taking because they're realizing it's not a growth industry anymore. Well, Trey, thank you very much for this. Uh, this is this episode two in a multi-part series. Next, we're going to be talking about policy implications of a mature and, de and soon to decline industry and what policymakers should do about that. So thank you very much for this. Well, thank you.